this new episode of Let's Talk AI. Today, I have the honor to be with Peter Cotton. Peter, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. I'm super happy to have you on the show today. Um, I have many questions, um, but for the people who might not know you yet, uh, could you introduce yourself in a few sentences? Oh, sure. Um, my name's uh, Peter Cotton. I work for Intech Investments, and I've been a, I will call myself a quant for most of my career, kind of a old school data scientist. What What is a quant for some people who are listening? Uh, could you define a bit better what do you mean by quant? So the financial sector was pretty quick to take on um, the kinds of people who might be called data scientists these days. Um, in terms of how a quant might differ from a data scientist, I would say it's we probably have a deep respect for markets and how difficult they are to beat. <laughs> That's one defining characteristic of a quant. And so a lot of quant theory is devoted to trying to use the information that's already present in markets. Hmm. Super interesting. Uh, maybe to, to, to get starting into this episode, um, I would like to ask you about maybe a little short retrospective about um, your career. And now uh, it is um, uh, kind of not fair for me to ask you that because you've done so many things. Uh, in uh, different sectors, uh, mainly the financial one. But um, could you share with uh, me and the audience uh, a bit of um, your career retrospectives? Oh, I spent my entire career on the, in the private uh, side, um, working for bulge bracket banks. Um, I've worked for Morgan Stanley. I worked for JP Morgan. Um, in between, I was an entrepreneur. I founded a data company that tried to use large-scale data assimilation methods um, to provide data to uh, hedge funds and others. More recently, I've been on the buy side. So I work for a hedge fund and um, work on things like portfolio theory, predictions of vital quantities that feed into that. Mm. Awesome. And uh, if you had to say what drives you today, um, what would you say? Oh, there's a lot going on today. <laughs> My goodness. Um, you know, this, this year has been one of the most interesting, I think, most interesting years intellectually in a long time. And so obviously there's a lot going on. Um, goes without saying that we're trying to harness some of the power of large language models. So that's it's definitely new. Um, there's other things that I'm working on as well. So I'm working on trying to unify different aspects of portfolio theory that... Uh, once seemed like disparate approaches. Um, and I'm also continuing to evolve my thoughts and my software around the notion of uh, collective intelligence in the small, if you will, and what what can be done with autonomous algorithms. Hmm. Autonomous algorithms. Um... Just from those few sentences, uh, I think there are different paths to go. Um, I think the, the first one is, um, let's go with um, portfolio theory and uh, portfolio management. How did you get into portfolio theories, portfolio management, um, uh, identifying as a quant? Um, could you give a bit more of your vision uh, and the way you learned uh, the theories you imply and, and kind of uh, get us through your vision of uh, the field right now, even though it's not directly related to data science or AI, but just um, to understand you better also. Yeah, interestingly, it is related to data science and AI. And perhaps one way to see that is to narrow down the portfolio problem and imagine that you just have a collection of you know, n random variables that are correlated. And mm. what you're trying to do is come up with some combination of them to minimize the variance of their sum. And that would arise if you were trying to build an ensemble model, perhaps, mm. uh, in machine learning. Um, it might arise if you're trying to combine different opinions of experts or different forecasting models or all sorts of things. So in some ways, parts of portfolio theory are very kind of fundamental problem about how you construct um, combinations of things. 
um, there is a long history going back to a paper by Harry Markowitz in 52, I believe, which outlined kind of the, the classic optimization solution to this problem. And so there's a whole track of theory, uh, of course, in literature that has followed on from that. Um, one notable example would be a branch called uh, stochastic portfolio theory, which deals with continuous time versions of Markowitz's theory. Um, another whole field of research is devoted to robustness of this approach, because what typically happens, and we probably saw this a bit in the M6 competition, is that if you take um, sort of off-the-shelf textbook portfolio theory and just apply it, there's a very good chance you're going to overfit um, and end up doing worse than, you know, doing more harm than good. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole theory devoted to how you really make this work and how things um, ensembles or models or combinations of assets will actually perform out of sample. Um, perhaps more recently, um, there's been this kind of interesting, uh, some, some call it a machine learning approach, where one takes a very defensive approach to looking at the covariance matrix of these assets, and you don't even really use it in a direct optimization at all. So there's a there's a fairly influential paper in 2015 um, on hierarchical risk parity, for example, which has had a little bit of an impact in industry and academia. And there you take a top-down approach instead and you say, you know, I'm just going to decide, uh, split my assets in two. I'm going to decide which proportion to allocate to one half or the other. And then I'm going to repeat this recursive procedure and eventually I'll end up allocating all my, my money. Mm -hmm. um, so... You could call this sort of a, a top-down and a bottom-up approach to portfolio theory. Mm. So one of the things I've worked on, um, one of the more fun things I did was show that they're actually the same. Mm. And that there's, there's a mathematical connection between those two um, types of approaches and an entire continuum uh, between them. Mm. So that, that's revealed by some obscure matrix inversion identities and things like this. Uh, but that, that's an example of why, you know, this field is fun. There's, mm -hmm. there's always a lot to figure out. And it's, in some ways, a very basic question, isn't it? It's like, you know, I have five models that people have given me. What, what should I take the average? You know, what should I do? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very curious now that you just stated that to, to stay in, um, in the um, financial part, uh, in the portfolio theory part, um, as a... Um, like when you have a data science uh, approach on trying to to for example connect this top um top um uh, can you repeat the two names of the of the two strategies that you connected yes so uh, one is called hierarchical risk parity in okay. finance um and then the other we could just call optimization okay um, and uh, it goes. It goes back in, in finance, at least. The history kind of goes back to uh, Harry Markowitz, who yes uh, worked on this. So this is kind of the Nobel Prize. Uh, and so, work. when you when you I'm sorry when you start working on a project like that, uh, and and uh, I assume that you published a, a paper about uh, about your um, your findings or or how you connected um, those two theories. Okay. Actually, not yet, because um, the journal thought it was too mathematical. <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay. So much for finance journals. <laughs> I, I shouldn't. I shouldn't laugh, but honestly, like it's it's so ridiculous. You know, you have these two areas of research. People are, are going off in one direction. Someone's working over here. They're arguing with each other, and um, in, in order to point out that they're actually doing the same thing, you have to have a little bit of mathematics. Sort of undergraduate linear algebra level, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, so yes, yeah, so I shouldn't say things like that, but um, no, it is it is funny. Um, uh, so so yeah, I have a working paper and I published a blog article, but most of what I do is just um, simulations, testing things, um, hmm. you know, seeing what really works because that's a very very subtle question. Exactly, this is where I was heading because. For example, if we take um, in a 
in in any field like when we're data driven we follow some kind of metrics and those metrics um i know that the book the lean startup or maybe traction um i couldn't state the author unfortunately but uh, i can put them in description um they talk about uh, vanity metric uh, which are metrics that show some things that we want to see but Mm -hmm. don't really show what's underlying in what we're studying uh, yep. to be more precise for example uh, in a business uh, maybe user growth is a vanity metric and the way users interact with a tool is a traction metric it have a deeper meaning and a deeper interpretation so where am i heading with that uh, i would like to ask you when you start a data science project or, or you do those theories, you, you mentioned that you try to test them and what works for real. So my question will be a bit broad, but I would mainly like to ask you, how do you approach problems like portfolio theories in terms of metrics, in terms of timelines? Because we can compare strategies i would assume in a specific context but do the same strategy in another context and so how do we define this context um this period of times um i will finish my question here i think this is a could you could you give us some some light on this it's a great question and a very very difficult one because in theory you should be able to separate different parts of your investment process. For example, you ought to be able to independently assess um, the, the alpha, if you will, which is the financial term for excess return of investing in certain stocks at certain times, mm -hmm. things like this. And then independently of that, you ought to be able to come up with or devise portfolio construction techniques that best take advantage of a noisy estimate of what you believe mm. and also a noisy estimate of how you, what you believe about the relationships between different stocks. Now that's where it gets really interesting um, because it is the relationships between different stocks that ultimately are going to impact your return at the portfolio level. Mm. So in theory, if you had a very good model, let's say a generative model for the stock market, and um, you had an understanding of your own process for extracting, let's say, alpha from exogenous data and you know, forming opinions on these things, mm -hmm. and then you had a machine that could do this many, many times, you would be able to test your machine and your machine would have all the all the important ingredients to it you know it would robustly try to extract information from the market it would try to use it presumably in some portfolio method that might be optimization based or it might be something else or it might be the in-between thing that i'm working on um, in any case if you could run this universe many many times then i think you would get a pretty good understanding of what really works out of sample to get to your question, though, about the vanity metrics, you know, in finance, the ultimate vanity metric is the back test, where mm. I say, well, this is my strategy. And uh, if I, if, big if, <laughs> if I had done it for the last 30 years, you know, I would have beaten the index by three points. Okay. Um, as has been pointed out by many authors, um, this is, is a very dangerous approach. Um, to where you kind of commingle different parts of the investment process and you start kind of tweaking things about the portfolio construction that relate to the alpha extraction and so forth. Um, you end up with a lot of knobs in this machine and you end up tweaking them perhaps more than you even realize yourself. So, you know, the, the long answer to your question is on the portfolio side, we try to do a number of different things. One of them is just live performance. So I kind of decided to stick my neck out and actually 
test this in a, in an open competition, you know, the M6 competition for a whole year. Um, it's only a year. But aside from that, I also do a whole bunch of work that's simulation based. And I'm trying to get a handle on what robust methods from the statistical toolbox, if you will, um, really work or are likely to work. And then when you piece these things together, you you have to have kind of this internal discipline uh, to just go with what probably, probably mm -hmm. is going to work best in the future hmm. and not what has worked in the past. And that's a very difficult thing to do, actually. Mm. Emotionally difficult thing to do. <laughs> it sure is. Um, so backtesting for the people who are listening who might not be very familiar, even though you kind of explain it, is when you use um, data from the past to test um, a specific strategy based on whatever strategies we've defined, for example, using a, a moving average, or uh, you can go way, um, way more complex than that, but uh, um, stating in the strategies that if something happens, then do this and um, testing it on a uh, back data. Uh, correct me if uh, my uh, weird definition um, no, uh, is... Uh... And so you mentioned simulation. Um, and so I, my next question after uh, defining backtesting was, what's the difference between backtesting and a simulation? I'm not sure if you mentioned live simulation, but can you explain us? Sure. Um... In some ways, what we're talking about here is the difference between the two halves of statistics, in a way, which um, there is the notion of uh, sometimes called inferential statistics, or uh, an old school term for it from a statistician, Bryman, was called data modeling. Mm. And he called it that because what you're actually doing is constructing a model for the data itself. And you're saying that there's data out there in the universe. And I, let's say in finance, we have one path of it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the history of the US. Um, but I believe that it was, you know, there is somewhere a magical machine that can generate this. Mm. And, uh, and if you reran the universe, you'd have a different path and so forth. Mm. So you're, you're taking the seemingly bold step of saying, I understand what the generative process for this, uh, for the stock market is. And for, for instance, it might be something like, well, the dependent structure between log returns is modeled by, you know, XYZ uh, multivariate distribution and the margins are such and such a process and the volatility process is this and that, and you know, so on and so forth. It's like any, any other, if you're modeling stocks or modeling rivers, whatever, you come up with a model. Um, and once you have that, then you could say, well, which portfolio methods work best for this generative model? Mm. And you can answer that question if need be by laborious simulation hmm. or perhaps simulation in combination with some analytic, you know, skullduggery, mm -hmm. but at least you can come up with an answer your answer is only going to be as good as your generative model is, hmm. but it may nonetheless be a more reliable answer than the answer you would get by just looking at one path of history. Hmm. All right. And um, you mentioned about uh, life. So you're in a life competition of, of one year, uh, testing your strategies. I would like to connect two dots I would like to talk about uh, sentiment analysis and the continuous data flows that is on social media. Mm. Uh, and I would like to connect this um, uh, with um, well, let me let me uh, let me rephrase um, rephrase uh, well um, this uh, my question. So. I would like to have your state on, from one side, the sentiment analysis and the continuous flow of data that can be used to take position, for example. And on the other end, I would like to ask you, you mentioned generative AI. 
uh, or you mentioned gener uh, generative, not necessarily generative AI, but a generative model. And so I would like to, to ask you uh, your opinion on the recent advancements with uh, large language models, LLMs, and how both LLMs and sentiment analysis using in real time data can impact the, um, a strategy, a portfolio strategy, and if they are linked, and what are your thoughts on the impact of those new advancements on the field? Many questions I at once, but uh, maybe no, that's is... okay. Uh, almost by construction, LLMs are linked to everything, and if you can't see the connection between LLM and application B, you can just ask the LLM, and it will tell you. <laughs> so, um, LLMs are an amazing new um, construct, which really changes everything some you know somebody i think used the catchphrase language is the new api another way of thinking about it is that algorithms now have this sort of weak generalized intelligence that gives them navigation ability it gives them imagination gives them the ability to modify code uh, give the talking about going back to my previous example you have a generative model for the market and you look at simulations of it and you tell the, the LLM, I don't like this. I don't like that. Could you make the volatility process bump, you know, bumpier? <laughs> and it will do it. <laughs> so um, the possibilities are endless uh, for LLMs everywhere. It's one of these things which um, if you don't spend all your day programming, you probably don't appreciate just how clever these things are. But they, they are ingenious. Um, of course... One of the applications is to real-time passing of information that is out there around us in newspapers and the blogosphere and CNN and so forth. And there are plenty of papers already that have um, noted the increased ability uh, to, to measure sentiment and, and so forth. That's not surprising. Um, I've also done a lot of experiments myself um, with LLMs. Uh, on the alpha front, which I'm not really free to talk about. Um, but I can talk about the fact that um, the ability to connect information and feed it into a real-time system, um, well, that is very, very clear. And the ability for it to enhance um, diversity to bring more people into the fold who can create models who otherwise couldn't, mm -hmm. but have ideas. Um, all of these things I think are really important and you can see it play out. You know, I, I built this platform microprediction.com where we feed stock market data, other people feed it, other data, whatever they want, actually, if they want it predicted by algorithms mm -hmm. and anyone can author an algorithm and that algorithm will send in predictions of the future typically an hour ahead or maybe as little as, you know, a minute ahead. Mm -hmm. And all of these predictions from everyone combine to create a probabilistic picture of the future for anything you want quickly. And so that, for example, gives me an immediate picture of um, stock volatilities or correlations, things like this yes. that, are, that are important to me. Um, but the amazing thing is how rich that kind of supply chain of prediction becomes when you have LLMs in the picture. Mm. In fact, it's so rich that I, I sat down with ChatGTP4 one evening and I said, um, this was before it had the web enabled version of it actually. And I said, hey, you know, this, uh, I, I run this site called microprediction.com. Would you, would you be interested in participating? And, and, I, and I said, uh, yeah, write, write me a time series model. You know, test it, uh, produce the plots, uh, modify it. Um, you know, I want this to work really well if volatility follows a certain pattern, you know, things like this. And just absolutely blown away by, by the suggestive power of uh, the LLMs and their, their, their power as a, as a sort of creative um, tool. And, uh, in domains where you have an answer, 
Mm-hmm. Of course, in finance, we always have an answer. You're predicting one minute ahead, you're going to know what the answer is a minute ahead, right? So you have this self-correction, you have this goal-seeking that's obvious. So when you combine that with the generative power of LLMs, I think the, the, the results are, are really intriguing for mm-hmm. obvious reasons. And that, of course, gets you away from a lot of the concerns about LLMs. You know, people complain that they hallucinate. Well, I don't know. I mean, half the things they hallucinate, I think, should exist, you know. <laughs> I always get a laugh sometimes when I, it, it, you know, LLM makes up a, a paper about time series modeling. And I think, well, actually, hmm, it's not a bad idea. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but getting down to nuts and bolts, these things can actually just create the algorithms and run them. And so, in a way, they're starting to make a mockery of that whole hmm cumbersome academic cycle i see i see no it is um very uh very interesting i think one one interesting thing that i could ask you is um to take us through your logic process of approaching a new idea or challenge uh that that you have um um Hmm. Would you feel comfortable sharing about, for example, a data science use case? Maybe you anonymize every content, but uh, to to just showcase a bit how you approach um, a problem or a specific things that you're looking um, into, and and how you you face challenges and and overcome them to to arrive to a to to, to what you wanted uh, in the first place. Oh, I see. So as, in other words, you know, what is an example of modeling and how to approach something? It's, it's a reasonable question, actually. Um, uh, it would probably be safest for me to answer with a, a, fair, a somewhat older example. But, you know, one of the things that intrigued me about um, the financial markets was the fact that um, the processes are quite uh, erratic. Mm -hmm. Um, And in fact, after I did my original studies, uh, you know, back when I was doing my PhD, um, subsequent to that, there's, there's been quite interesting developments, actually, in, in the theory of stochastic processes. And, um, uh, and um, there's been a fascinating developments there. But at the time, I was interested in the case where the assumptions that volatility was constant were violently um, uh, false. <laughs> and... Uh, and, and so much so, I, want, I was studying these very bursty volatility processes. And one way to model those is to assume that the volatility process itself is, let's say, the exponential of some mean reverting process. So it goes on these big excursions and the underlying process um, exhibits these violent uh, moves as a result, uh, so violent that they look like jumps. Mm. Um, and, and so the question then arises is, well... You, it's easy to dream up these models, but it's harder to um, understand the intuition behind them. For instance, if you have a volatility model where the volatility behaves violently, as I put it, how does that affect the pricing of a stock option? Um, how does it affect the the so-called option smile, which is the, the first order thing which option traders look at? Mm-hmm. And... Um, and can you determine this without um, making things too complicated or just, you know, sort of getting lost in the math? Mm-hmm. Uh, and so fortunately for me, um, there were some some good ideas around uh, drawn from applied mathematics for dealing with this type of problem. Um, Jean-Pierre Fouque, for instance, I think was one of the originators of this of this methodology. Mm-hmm. Uh, Circa, sort of my academic brother has worked on it, George Papa Nicolau, Knut Solner, and, and others. And the idea was to 
use the um, differences in time scales that you might observe and um, assume that, and that enables you to kind of tear the, the partial differential equations apart. And um, it, it allows you to think about the solution of a complex model as being the solution of a much simpler model, um, albeit one with different parameters. So you might replace constant volatility with a kind of averaged volatility. Um, and then you have kind of correction terms on, on top of this. Uh, so that, that was, you know, an example of using applied mathematics technique, which mm -hmm. had already been uh, successfully deployed in other fields and bringing it over to finance. Mm. Hmm. This is super interesting. I have a lot of questions. Um, I think, um, well, maybe for, um, for people who are listening, um, could you take us back to how it all started? And what do I mean by that? I mean, how did you end up in uh, mathematics and interested in finance? Can you share a bit um, of how your interest and passion started around the field? Oh, my, my background, um, I think there were different strands to it. So uh, I, w I was always interested in mathematics. Um, I was into studied mathematics and physics in, in high school and undergrad. I think by the time I was in undergrad, I was starting to feel that the mathematicians were explaining things better than the physicists. <laughs> that's probably not fair. Um, but that's, that's how I felt that the, the mathematical explanations were, um, held together better. Um, they seemed less arbitrary. They were sometimes more geometric in nature. Um, and the physics side of things, it felt like, um, I don't know, it felt like sort of ritual and ceremony and, uh, certain tricks and calculations that you repeated because other people had and, and so forth. Uh, so anyway, I, long story, but I sort of drifted towards mathematics as a result. But I was always fairly interested in the practical side of applied mathematics and how it applied to, you know, trying to make money. I was actually fascinated by whether you could use mathematics to make money betting on horses and things like this. Hmm. Um, so there's, there's always been these two strands, kind of the, the pure side of me and the uh, very not pure side. <laughs> I'm not sure if uh, it's not pure, uh, the money related part, uh, funny, funny way to, what is the first project that you did where you mixed your mathematics skills, uh, with a financial purpose? Is it horses like gambling on horses? <laughs> it may have been actually it may yes it may have been um uh you know i've done different <laughs> different things over the years <laughs> um <laughs> could you share yeah. one or is it all uh well, all confidential? It, maybe an example of, of where math is 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 useful because mm -hmm. you know so people sometimes are a little too quick to dismiss uh you know, mathematics or the kind of, you know, versus, um, you know, using tools. Or mm -hmm. um, so when I arrived at my f very first job, uh, it was at Morgan Stanley in probably 2001, I started full time and it was sort of the beginning of the credit derivatives boom. And some of the financial securities that were traded and risk managed were done so through a pretty laborious kind of overnight system mm -hmm. uh, with, you know, millions of Monte Carlo paths thrown everywhere. And I took a look at it from a mathematical perspective and I realized that all of these calculations could be short circuited. And so I, figured out the mathematics side of it. And then I implemented it in a little Excel spreadsheet. Um, it was a little tool that was 
one of the traders called the mini muncher. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was called the mini muncher for obvious reasons. It had almost no footprint at all, and yet it produced the same answers as the uh, as the firm system. And so, the traders immediately kind of threw away the, <laughs> the threw away the um, what they had been using, and just everybody started using this. And before long, I I had I, I gained an appreciation for um, people have forgotten this, but some people will remember DLL hell, um, where you're trying to maintain. Um, uh, analytic systems in Excel across multiple different versions of uh, operating systems in Excel and slightly different, you know, installations and so forth. Uh, so that, that was my introduction, and that was maybe that's kind of an example of where you have kind of this little spark of mathematical insight, um, and then it kind of flows into a lot of messy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I see. I see. And if we, if we keep on this, um, maybe, maybe not necessarily this specific example, uh, but thanks for, for sharing. Um, if we if we go in the same direction, uh, I assume that um, when when we study portfolio theories or when we study how to how to get value of mathematics in in the finance sec in the financial sector. Is there um, a way, is there a moment where when we find something new, a new patterns that no one is doing? For example, when when you did that thing, um, once everyone starts doing it, does it mean that it is not um, effective anymore, or it really depends on what are we talking about? Is there if it's a long term strategy, but is there like a curve line where when a breakthrough happens, it have way more leverage than after 10 years, this tool exists for trading, for example? I mean, not necessarily. In part because different players in the market have different constraints and different motivations and different targets and so forth and different clients who mm. may or may not be willing to go in certain directions. Um, and there's always a little bit of a not invented here thing as well. So actually there's some natural barriers to <laughs> um, propagation of ideas sometimes. Um, but I think more than that, usually, you know, successful enterprises are not built on one idea. They're built on an aggregation of a large number of them hmm. over the years and some diligent work and smart people. Um, and good systems. So uh, it's usually not the case that, um, you know, you can just kind of pick up something and run with it. Hmm. Hmm. I see. And um, all right. So, so that's, um... that, that said, I, I would certainly agree with you that the democratization of analytics and forecasting and, you know, open source, everything. Yes. Um, has certainly raised the bar on mm. kind of purely, you know, uh, sort of econometric forecasting of, of stocks and things like this. That's certainly the case. Hmm. You mentioned your first uh, job at um, um, Morgan Stanley, right? And um, and you mentioned finding these and everyone was using it on Excel sheets. Today we have... Uh, the recent uh, models, LLMs models. Um, but in data science in general, we have new technologies, new tools. I would like to ask you about the evolution of putting in production models that helps you take decisions in this field. Could you give us some insight? Oh, it's a broad category. Um... There are some applications where Excel is perfectly fine uh, for data science. Uh, there are some very different applications where that would be very tedious mm. and um, difficult to evolve and maintain and so forth. But, you know, in general, one shouldn't be too quick to kind of judge a particular technology because 
how it affects the workflow of someone, what they're really trying to do. Um, is it a high risk case? Is it a low risk case? Um, you know, what's the intent here? Would a more complex technology actually just remove people's access to numbers, which they probably should be seeing? Um, does it gate that information too much? There are a lot of considerations to, to think about um, when it comes to quote data science technology. Mm -hmm. As you get older, <laughs> as I as I have a habit of doing, um, you start to become a lot less um, opinionated about technology. Okay, I think <laughs> um, you can get you can get things done with just about anything if you really want to. Um, it's more about do you bring a kind of a developer philosophy to it? Hmm. You know, you know, can you can you construct something in a fairly clean way? Um, can you resist uh, the temptation to do things which are going to cost a lot of time and effort later on? It's a judgment call, but I think you you work on a lot of different projects and you, you know, you use a lot of different approaches to each one and you kind of slowly get a feel for it over time, but you also become more confused than ever about what the right thing to do is. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that would be my view. I'd say be, beware of people who are overly confident in a particular choice of technology. Hmm. All right. Okay. Thank you. Um, I would like to come back to the moment where you were an entrepreneur and uh, you you went working in a hedge fund. Um, can you take us through your entrepreneurial journey and what made you um, going um, into the hedge fund you uh, actually are? Yes, it was a strange thing in some ways because I never would have characterized myself as an entrepreneur necessarily. And, but I started a company in 2007, I believe it was. And the intent was to fix the risk models hmm. applied to structured credit. Um, and, in t and previously in my job, I had been um, a staunch advocate of trying to take the time to properly measure the risk in, in credit pro products in particular, CDOs, CDO squares, so forth. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's now several movies about this, <laughs> this once arcane area of finance. Um, but, uh, you know, I knew there was, there was a lot to do. And, uh, it was uh, the, the flaws with the model. Some were simple, but some were, were not so simple. It was a fairly mathematical area. Uh, the general culture in that particular area of finance wasn't so technical, actually, surprisingly so. There are some areas of finance um, where which attracted highly technical people, actually. In fact, I remember talking to, for instance, some of our interest rate traders who had PhDs in statistics and so forth, right? So you had these, you know, had, a, had the appropriate background. Credit was a little bit different. You had a lot of people who didn't have that background. Mm. And the business had been driven because of other things, a regulatory arbitrage mm -hmm. in some ways, of a pretty large one. So that's a bit of a long story, but that's... I sort of what led me to create my own company was I just felt that if I just didn't do this, that wasn't going to happen. Um, and so that's what I did. Um, it was a pretty tough start to the company, actually. Um, the first couple of years were very were pretty rough because the, the credit crisis had completely wiped out the, <laughs> the target audience. <laughs> um, if, if it had been a third of the global financial crisis or a half, it would have been absolutely perfect, and uh, at least for my business, and it would have been great. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the tidal wave just kind of you know knocked everything over. So 
I eventually pivoted and I ran into a private equity firm who had a strong thesis. And they said, look, uh, honestly, we don't care too much for your business, <laughs> um, but uh, we like you. And uh, can you price every bond and every credit default swap in the United States every 10 seconds? And I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <laughs> and then sat down to figure out how to do that. So that was, that was how my company started. Uh, it was renamed Benchmark. And um, it, was a, it, was a, it was an amazing journey, actually, just because of the sheer quality of the people who were involved in it. Um, we had a reunion recently. We looked back on like this collection of uh, quants and technologists, you know, in particular, who were just outstanding. And uh, some of them have gone on to do great things. Um, in fact, uh, you know, a couple of the alum alumni went and, and founded um, InfluxDB, which is a, a unicorn now. Um, others are, are heading up, you know, large uh, tech consulting uh, companies. So, uh, amazing time. Um, could have panned out better commercially. Um, learned a few things, perhaps forgot a few things. I don't know. Uh, but it was, it's kind of fun to, looking back, to build a machine that was, you know, sucking in millions of data points, doing what humans were trying to do at the end of the day and failing to. Um, it's a pity that only after the fact, when I went to go to JP Morgan to oper you know, optimize their flow trading operation, that I, I finally was able to look at benchmark prices, um, or at least some version of benchmark prices it was recreated at Bloomberg um, against the opposition and, and match them up trade by trade and look at the look at the accuracy. And at that point, we realized, oh my goodness, we were like 10, 20% more accurate. Um, and, and it was autonomous and we were doing it every, you know, continuously. And, and so it was a, it's a shame that that, that kind of incredible machine has actually never been recreated um, with the same inputs. It's um, so uh, it's one of those things. Um, hmm. And that has been mainly your, um, your entrepreneurial journey, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, in my present role, I, my time is split. I am, I do have some time to work on, uh, the micro prediction project, uh, which is, which is entrepreneurial, okay. um, in, in that sense, it is creating something from scratch, uh, that, that has, has potential, but, um, that's a, that's a smaller project, um, certainly than, than benchmark was at this point. Hmm. And is it different working, uh, in uh, the hedge fund industry around portfolio theories, um, does like how, uh, so I understand that you still do some kind of entrepreneurial tasks. Um, uh, but, um, how different is it from what you are doing in your previous, um, previous jobs and, and what it, like what, how your daily, daily tasks, are looks like from what you can say, of course. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's different on the, on the buy side. Um, I think I spent, you know, maybe 12, 13 years working in, in, in banks where the pace tends to be quite frenetic and the, you know, you do something quickly, get something done you know, sometimes move on. Depends what area you're in. Some areas are more transactional than others. Um, on the buy side, at least uh, for me thus far, it's, there have been some aspects that have been a bit frenetic, especially when I was building and maintaining a live platform on my own. <laughs> so that has its challenges. Uh, things go wrong. <laughs> um, you know, I've had all sorts of fun. Um, 
you know, data vendor pulling my entire database out from under me and trying to hot swap a system, you know, in the middle of the day from <laughs> one, one database to another. That was fun. Um, so, um, but yeah, but there's also this, this side of it, which is, look, there's this problem out there. It's, you know, how do you, how do you allocate money? And it's not a new problem. And the new ideas in this area are pretty few and far between, actually. They, they don't come along very often. And so it's, uh, and a lot has been written, of course. It's a huge literature. But a lot of the, a lot of the literature is kind of like, you know, if we swap out X for Y in this place, does it make it better? You know, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Nothing wrong with that, but... It's a, it's a different kind of challenge because if you can, at least in my view, if you can uncover something that's, that has a genuinely new perspective on the problem, um, then that potentially has application of significant scale. Hmm. You think about the, the amount of money, for instance, right now that is invested passively on indexes well, trading costs are pretty close to zero these days. And so the index is an arbitrary point in the portfolio space. The probability of it being correct is, is zero, right? It is, it is almost surely wrong. Um, uh, so what do you do instead? It's a non-trivial problem, isn't it? It sure is. Uh, and, but if you can come up with a slightly better solution that that gives you a kind of an important baseline. And then if you can start to build upon that with old sources of data and new sources of data, um, certainly LLMs in particular, uh, then I think, you know, you can get somewhere. Hmm. Super interesting. I need to watch again myself this part of the podcast to uh, think of uh, my own strategies. <laughs> um, so just before I, I ask you, uh, uh, we're almost at, at the end of the podcast and uh, I have some of uh, my final questions, uh, three of them. But just before that, um, you read a lot of GitHub and, and you look at a lot of repositories. And if I'm not wrong, you, you also contribute to different packages. Uh, you also uh, do many work um, uh, that I would be interested in hearing about. And uh, and uh, last time we spoke, you, you mentioned uh, a book also. Uh, could you give us, um, can you share about open source, about uh, the code that is there, the value it has in your own code, and maybe a bit of your book and, and what you have available uh, today out, out there? Yeah, so working backwards, I suppose, my book, um, you know, it's called Micro Prediction, Building an Open AI Network. Mm-hmm. And it is a thesis, essentially. It is saying, look here, let us think about data science and does it make sense? Um, let us consider the problem of searching the world's models and data to find the best combination of things. And we can safely assume that if a hedge fund can employ the best people on earth and throw limitless resources at technology and data and so forth, then a few things on planet earth are gonna be predicted quite well. I mean, the price of Apple stock is predicted quite well. But everything else is pretty mediocre. So, you know, how do you solve search? And what does that mean? I mean, there might be an idea in an obscure GitHub repo. And I do spend a lot of time on obscure GitHub repos <laughs> looking for ideas and things that people have done. Um, because sometimes it's quicker to look at the code and just run it and you know see what's going on than to you know try to read a paper where people are forced to take the core idea and wrap it in this layer of ceremony and dance and whatever. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. 
you know, how do you solve the, the search for models? How do you solve the search for data? You know, let's say it's one thing if you're a data scientist, you think, well, I can Google for this and that. Maybe I can buy this data, ask my boss to buy it or something. All right, that's fine. But what, what if you're just like a bakery or something or an independent bookstore and you want to predict the number of customers who are going to walk in in the next hour? What's the solution to that? Mm-hmm. How do you solve search in the space of models and data? And so the, the, the core thesis of this book is that, look, it's, the way to try to solve this is by encouraging a kind of microeconomy of autonomous algorithms hmm. and trying to use the price mechanism to solve search. Only really works if you can autonomously assess the quality of the quote AI that's being produced. And so that's why I call it micro prediction, because this is intended to conjure the notion of millions of little predictions and not one big prediction like whether Donald Trump is going to win the next election. Um, so, you know, open source is, um, I think, incredibly important. But, and part of my contributions there is to try to build packages that do benchmarking of open source libraries. So it's relatively easy to bring things into a common signature. And for example, if you are looking for a derivative free optimizer, then there's 30 pretty reasonable packages out there, but which one is going to be best for your problem, right? That's a, that's a search problem. Everybody has a search cost. And so um, I try to reduce that search cost in a small way by, by creating these libraries. Same for, same, same for time series prediction. You know, you have a, a, you have your own problem. Maybe you're predicting tides. I don't know. Maybe you're predicting the number of emojis on Twitter, which methodology or class of methodologies or package or method within the package is going to help you best in your problem. Hmm. If you have enough data that should be solved autonomously, right? It should be. Um, the things that stop it being solved autonomously are all these little frictions, like the fact that somebody chooses one API for a package and somebody chooses another, or you never find it in the first place because it's not talked about on, you know, towards data science or some nonsense. Um, and so in the, in the process of trying to extract the best ideas out there, you know, I've, I've noticed that um, there is almost no relationship between popularity and quality in this field, almost none whatsoever. Uh, it's just mostly meme following, it seems. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, it's open source. In some ways, it feels like this incredible untapped well of ideas. And imagine if you could have algorithms finding their way from GitHub repos to problems instead of the other way around without a human data scientist being in the middle. Mm-hmm. And all of those ideas and all of that creativity that's gone into um, writing this code could be used so much more effectively. Another kind of tragedy of the commons, at least in my view, is that you don't have enough specialization. You know, no, nobody is smart enough to fully assess their own modeling, right? I mean, if I've built a model and you look at the errors in my model, maybe you can find something there that I can't. I mean, if I could find something in there, I probably, probably would have fixed my model, right? <laughs> so um, so one, one of the things I do, for example, at micro prediction is I'll create my own predictions of things. And then I'll use my model to transform the data into something that should be noise. And then I'll see if somebody else can find signal in the noise. It's kind of like automatic ongoing performance analysis. If you take that vision to its extreme, or if you apply recursive logic to it, then you arrive at the thesis that the future of data science is actually long chains, supp- micro supply chains, if you will, these sort of radically low cost supply chains where the participants are these statistical algorithms or pieces of statistical algorithms that are endowed with just enough economic logic. And these days, just enough weak 
generalized intelligence, thinks LLMs, to participate in the supply chain. Hmm. That's the core thesis of the book and how it relates to, to open source. Um, and of course, I do what I can to promote the notion of other firms doing the same thing. Um, and I allow anyone to use my platform. Hmm. Right? On the margin, it doesn't really cost me that much. It's, you know, you set up a stream, all the algorithms are there already. It's easy for them to hop from my streams to your streams. So if you want something predicted, there's no skin off my nose. You know, it's not like we spend a lot of money marketing this or anything, but like if people want to use it, they can. And and so if somebody else or another firm adopted a similar strategy, then before long, you might start to lower the friction or these, these sort of barriers to, to entry between algorithms and business problems. And people might even think more about taking the business problems and reconstituting them or reformulating them so that they can be solved by, you know, let's say a list of 10 commodity repeated prediction tasks. So yeah, that's, that's part of what I'm trying to advocate. And it is in some ways the beneficiaries might ultimately be the smaller firms or the smaller players or the individuals or the not-for-profits or whoever who are never going to employ a single data scientist, let alone have a quote data science org. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, it puts uh, a lot of perspective and uh, it's super interesting and uh, I, I like how it gives credit to the open source community. Um, there are so many, and, and I always ask myself, how is it possible that so many people, so many talented people do so many great things and everything is open source and not enough people look into it. And, um, well, I and hope the uh, European, the European parliament is listening. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope. Uh, I'm sure they are. Um, so, uh, just, so we, we're at the end of the, of the podcast. I have uh, three little questions. The first one is how do you keep learning? Um, and how do you keep, keep being curious and building things and keep being motivated at what you do? Oh, honestly, I've never, never considered not doing it. <laughs> Um, you know, ultimately it's what, it's, it's what gives you pleasure. If we can put you in the right flow state of mind, if every now and then you can have an idea that nobody else has had, um, you know, that's what you hope for. Mm. I've, I've got some, some enough joy out of it over the years to, to counter the frustrations. <laughs> And uh, in terms of um, books, newspapers, movies, media, or whatever it is, do you have um, do you have some recommendations? Uh, both in terms of, uh, like I said, some some things like people can read, but also some tips if someone is starting in the field um, and might need some guidance. Yeah, I mean, all of the above. Um, I think, you know, some of the foundational areas in mathematics and statistics have really excellent coverage in very clear, um, you know, classic textbooks and so forth, where people have put a lot of work into presenting those ideas with as much clarity as possible. Um, so there's no downplaying that quote, old fashioned resource. Um, you know, in addition, I do put a little bit of effort in trying to tweak the, the great recommendation engines that rule our lives these days. Um, LinkedIn, in my case, I, I try to like and follow people who I think are doing interesting things. And um, it takes a bit of work to 
turn your feed from anything other anything beyond baby mush into you know, something that actually occasionally brings you interesting things. Um, but it's probably worth it. Um, yeah, it's it's hard to to stay abreast of everything. Of course, lately um, we have a I've had a new conversational partner um, in the form of Chat GPT four who's extraordinarily knowledgeable on just about every field and its connections. And so, um, I don't know if you're old enough to remember sort of that weird giddy feeling of, you know, searching the net for, or maybe even when maybe if you discover Wikipedia for the first time, you know, things like this, it's, it's one of those moments where you've been presented with stack overflow. Um, yeah. Sometimes I, I think of it as that, uh, you know, the box in Ghostbusters, the proton pack, and they've just like taken everything and zapped it into this thing. And it's, it's like, well, hmm. how do you understand what's in this box now? Hmm. Because you know, there's so much in there. And the yeah. more, the more you probe it, the more you realize that you don't know all the things that are in there and you yeah. keep going. Yeah. It's definitely one of those expanding boundary uh, situations. Yeah. And it's tricky because it's not, um, for for what I've seen, uh, only speaking of, for example, ChatGPT, uh, I have a use of it that seems intuitive to me because I play with it a lot, but it is not at all for a lot of people. And sometimes I'm, a lot of people are not prompting well. And so they're like, all right, I just pass because it doesn't give me what I'm looking for. But when you're a bit more precise and you know a little bit better what you're looking at, becomes so powerful yeah i mean it's made it's honestly it's made me feel a bit better about things i mean it's, sometimes it's not really a big part of my job but sometimes i've tried to do things that i think should be useful to other people and and when you put effort into that and uh and you know they don't use it you're like huh like what should i be you know frustrated if you're you know, building a company selling a product whatever um it made me feel a bit better actually as an entrepreneur and, and just as a producer of things in general, that there is a vast number of people who don't think that chat GPT is useful <laughs> because I've realized that, you know, <laughs> if they don't think that's useful, then yeah, <laughs> I agree. I really can't, I really can't help you if you don't think that's useful or if you don't think that's, a new kind of bar or a, a new kind of um, utility. I just, I agree. There I is no helping some people. There is a very interesting niche right now about um, doing courses for specific industries on how to use correctly uh, generative AI and, and LLMs. So if you're listening and, and, and you don't know what to do as a hustle business, go for it <laughs> because you take a small industry and, yeah. and, 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 a lot of people, I, I would say the majority, speaking without numbers, uh, that need more time to start using it to a point where it's useful. But yeah, that's, my, that's my perspective. Yeah, I have um, on the micro prediction blog, I have some examples that I've taken the time to, to write up. You know, one of them was I sat down with ChatGPT for to discuss American football strategy. And um, it knew so much. It knew the completion percentages. It had kind of a the sort of understanding of control theory and the various things that um, you could think about how to um, wield the field position and turn that into strategic decisions and so forth. And at the end, um, ChatGPT and myself came to the conclusion that football strategy was wrong and that, you know, it has been wrong for a hundred years. So, um, you're welcome to, to, to take issue with me on that particular example, but you know, it's, it was, to me, it was eye opening because it's a sort of thing where you could try to have that discussion, even with a professional, with an offensive coordinator, um, with someone in the business and I have done that and you might get nowhere, but when you sit down with chat GPT four, it follows the thread. It's very, it's hyper rational. It does its best to congeal things. 
um, and it can do calculations. It can, I'm going to say it can reason. People will throw things at me because they say that, but I'm just going to say it. It can reason. And that's pretty incredible, actually. Hmm. I had a... It's incredible. It is. Um, Not so much because I think that machines are just about to get to some um, state that we have written about in sci-fi or whatever, but more just because it has revealed to me how much of human thinking is somewhat mechanical or, you know, yeah, it's just sort of autocomplete, you know, humans autocomplete a lot. Indeed. I, I had this, uh, we recorded a, a podcast recently, uh, with a friend of mine. Um, um, he's, um, he works for a fintech. He works for an investment uh, company. They build it from scratch. Uh, he's a CTO at this company, and we had uh, we had this uh, two-hour podcast about um, AI philosophy, the history, uh, AGI, um, um, and like uh, reasoning and all of these. And those are points that we uh, we state. Some of those points. Um, uh, might uh, go in what you're saying and some uh, won't but I, I really like those discussions and I feel like they're super important um, not only to think in the sci-fi part or when we're going to implement those technologies in robots which is something that have been the will of people for a long time if we come back to uh, old cartoons but um, uh, what I feel is uh, super important is um, regulations around all of these because maybe we're thinking of uh, either AGI is achievable or not either models can reason or not um, um, but uh, in the end the threats are not those uh, upcoming events but they are already there and uh, like with disinformation it is super easy to build um it is super easy to, to build content machines that just throw out this information. And, um, and so I think all these topics about AI are super important to be discussed, not only for the sci-fi part, but also for like regulations and making ground. Yeah. Work. They are, they are certainly. And, and, if, you know, in fairness, some of these issues have, have always been discussed. I mean, they, they were discussed when the printing press was invented. They were, just, they were discussed, you know, or well, maybe maybe no one discusses this, but the, you know, think about how dangerous the word processor is. It's actually easier to produce um, terrible things, terrible written things with a with your keyboard than it is with <laughs> ChatGPT. Chat you can try to tell ChatGPT to say something terrible and it refuses to. <laughs> yeah. Um, look, I mean, uh, it's... It's such a crazy space right now because nobody can agree on how powerful these things are. Um, the same people who are saying they're not terribly powerful, look how dumb they are, are also calling for regulation because they're so dangerous. Um, it's it's a little hard for me to get you know, my own head around this, to be perfectly honest. Um, I'm still trying to understand what is going on and I don't think it's obvious that well put it this way I think the kind of naive reductionism kind of died a few months ago like it's just um, you know and the leaders of the field are saying certain things and when you use this every day for your work you know that there's something going on here and so to completely dismiss this based on some regurgitated explanation of, you know, ML for dummies just doesn't wash anymore with a lot of people. It doesn't wash with roughly 20% of AI researchers. And maybe that percentage will change. Right? I mean, sort of at least the one survey I saw, 80% of AI researchers were certain that 
machines can't, you know, think or whatever. I don't remember the exact wording. Um, but 20% weren't. And, you know, if that survey was done two years ago, it wouldn't be 20%. It would be 2%. Yeah. Um, you know, as an example of how quickly the earth is, the ground is moving, I, I pulled out um, Gary Marcus's most recent book, Rebooting AI, which, which is kind of a, you know, a book length uh, treatise on all the ways that AI is failing to be capable and stumbling over this problem and that problem and this problem, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's probably the most recent and prominent example of that kind of critique. And I went, I, I managed to pull out 20 examples, 20 language examples from his book. And, and I fed them to GPT 3.5 and to GPT 4 and realized that, you know, GPT 3.5 already solves like 70% of these. GPT 4 solved all of them and could even discuss around the question and could generate new types of questions that were completely different and solve them and so forth. Like it's, it's just moving so fast. I mean, it's, a, you know, I joke that some of these ML critique papers just, they need use by dates and those use by dates aren't much, you know, aren't much longer than bread sometimes. Hmm. Indeed. I think there are, uh, we'll need to redefine a lot of what we mean by, for example, reasoning and, what we mean by a lot of things uh, i think nowadays only yeah. thing it will be easier um, to state uh to state um bd um uh in a previous episode it will be easier to predict if uh, content is human than to predict um i mean to verify if a content is from a human than to verify if a content is from an ai because you can always do like some human verifications. Um, uh, I would like to add so many things to this discussion, um, but um, I want to also respect your time. Um, I have one more question. Well, two more questions, if that's okay with you. The yes. first first one is where can people uh, look into your word, your repository, your websites, everything that you have out? or even reach out to you if they have questions. Uh, I would just Google for micro prediction. Micro prediction. All right. And on LinkedIn, oh, you're so ask chat GPT. <laughs> how to find you. <laughs> uh, and, um, and you have also, uh, you are, um, you have a LinkedIn account where you, you do some posts Should people connect with you there. Uh, yes. Yes. You can find me there. Um, yeah, Peter Cotton on, on LinkedIn. It's really the only, social platform that I, that I can stomach. <laughs> <laughs> I feel the same way. Um, well, Peter, thanks a lot for coming on the show. It was um, uh, an honor to have you here uh, to share. Uh, I would like to have, um, uh, I would like to share some more thoughts about AI, about what is happening. But, um, but um, thanks again for all the knowledge that you shared, um, it have been, uh, like I said, an honor. Would you have a message for the Let's Talk AI community? Um, it can be personal, professional, um, anything that you could have in mind. Oh, goodness. I mean, the AI community comprises a huge number of very smart people who I'm sure many know more about life and its motivations than me. So I, I don't know if, if I have anything profound to um to to convey um it can be a quote or a book or again if they if they if they google for for micro prediction they will find some free stuff that they can have <laughs> <laughs> so let's say final messages um, um i mean hand. yeah i mean look my 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 sort of my own little thesis is, is pretty much contained in the micro prediction book. And, and there's a, there's a TLDR on the website and so forth. Um, you know, my, I, I'm, I'm trying to bring something to this whole AI discussion, which is kind of from the quant school of thinking a little bit. And, and the quant school of thinking is at least, at least translated to, to AI is a fairly simple one. All I'm saying is that markets have always been the best thing at predicting. Nobody in quant, nobody in quant, quant finance thinks otherwise. I mean, if you if you don't believe that, um, look up look up what I did in the M six, you know, worldwide financial forecasting con contest. I 
finished in the 97th percentile without doing any work because I used a market. Um, and so the, you know, my thesis is really a simple one. Markets are better at predicting than models, but they're harder to wield. Well, they have been harder to wield. Uh, but if you can make them easier to wield, then I think they are an incredibly important missing ingredient in most data science pipelines. Hmm. And so I'm trying to, I use them successfully in my own pipelines. If other people want to try that as well, great, happy to, happy to help. Yeah. That's awesome. Thanks a lot, Peter, for coming on the show. Uh, I wish you all the best uh, with everything and I look forward to speak with you again soon. And I wish you to have a wonderful day and thanks for everyone uh, who is still with us on, on the episode. And I wish you also a wonderful day.